Author's note. Maha Yoga is the direct method of finding the truth of ourselves. It has nothing in common with what is commonly known as yoga, being simple, free from mysteries, because it is concerned with the utter truth of our being, which is itself extremely simple. Maha Yoga frees its follower from his beliefs, not to bind him with new beliefs, but to enable him to pursue with success the quest of the true self, which transcends all creeds. Maha Yoga has been described as a process of unlearning. Its follower has to unlearn all his knowledge, because being in relativity, it is ignorance and therefore a hindrance. This true yoga is the subject matter of the Upanishads, but the truth that is to be found by this yoga is eternal and needs to be testified to by living witnesses from time to time. This book starts with the very reasonable assumption that only a living teacher can tell us the Upanishadic truth, not the Upanishads themselves, because they are just words and little more, while the living teacher is an incarnation of the truth we seek. The living teacher of our age was the sage of Arunachala, Bhagavan Sri Ramana, of whose life a brief sketch is given in the first chapter. His teachings are treated in this book as the primary authority, and the Upanishadic lore as next in value, as amplifying and supplementing it. The reader need not accept anything that is set forth here unless he finds it to be in consonance with the actual teachings of the sage. Chapter 1 The Sage of Arunachala There is a profound truth in us, the truth of ourselves, the practical knowledge of which will make us free. But he that would be free must seek, reverently question one that is himself free. So says the ancient lore. Thus, it emphasizes the need of resort to a living teacher of the truth, of the real self, if one such can be found. The knowledge that comes by the study of the sacred lore is of little value. One can learn more and more quickly from the silence of a living teacher than he can gather by a lifetime of the study of the books. We are told by the great teacher Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa that there are two kinds of sages, namely those who are born with the mission to teach and elevate other men, and those who have no such mission. The former are from birth untainted by worldly desires. They win the state of deliverance about the time they cease to be boys, and they do so with little or no effort. The latter are born in subjection to worldly desires and weaknesses and have to go through a long period of sustained and well-directed effort in order to reach the same goal. The former kind of sage is naturally very rare. Whenever such one appears, multitudes of disciples and devotees are drawn to him, and they profit greatly in his presence. Bhagavan Sri Ramana is such a one. He is the last of a long line of great sages who have renewed and confirmed the teaching of the ancient revelation. He was born in the south of India in the village of Tiruchuzi, about 30 miles from Madura, and received the name of Venkatararam. His father died when he was 12 years old, and after that he was brought up by his mother and uncles. The boy was sent for education, first to Dindigul and then to Madura, which is a great center of pilgrimage. His guardians had no suspicion of what he was destined to become. They tried their best to fashion him after their own idea of what he should become. They sought to equip him for the life of the world by giving him a good education. The boy was not at all wanting in intelligence, but he was incorrigibly indifferent to his studies. He would put forth no personal effort to learn and remember. In so far as he did learn something, he did so in spite of himself. The reason was that he had no will to get on in the world, which every boy has who is above the average. 
We now know that he was one of those rare beings who bring with them an endowment of spirituality, that perfection which was to make him the revered master of millions of men existed in him already, in a latent state. And it is a law of nature that a spiritual endowment makes one indifferent to worldly gains. It is because the average man is poorly endowed in a spiritual sense that he falls an easy prey to worldly desires. Urged by these desires, he takes great pains to achieve what he calls success in life. We know that Sri Ramakrishna also had an incorrigible aversion to this bread-winning education. Thus the boy Ramana gained hardly any knowledge while at school, but destiny put in his hands a copy of an ancient sacred book in Tamil, which gives detailed narratives of the sixty-three saints of the cult of Shiva. He read it through with fervor. We have reason to believe that he had already been a saint of the same high degree of excellence, and had passed this stage of spiritual evolution. He had, in him, the potentiality of something far higher, namely the status of a sage. When we come to the chapter on devotion, we shall be able to see the difference between a saint and a sage. For the present, we need only say that the sage differs from the saint, as the ripe fruit does from the flower. Saintliness is no more than the promise of sagehood, which alone is perfection. When Jesus told his disciples, Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he had in mind the sage, not the saint. Even as a little boy, Ramana was continually aware of something supremely holy, whose name was Arunachala. This we learn from a poem composed by the sage later for the use of his disciples. We see that he brought over from his past lives a fully ripe devotion to that mysterious being, which most of us call God, but which may be more justly described as the spiritual center of life. This was seen on one occasion in his boyhood when an uncle of his spoke to him harshly. He then went for consolation and peace, not to his earthly mother, but to the Divine Mother in the temple of the village. Sometimes also he would fall into what seemed to be an exceptionally profound sleep, a sleep from which nothing could wake him. If we may judge from the perfection which he attained later and which he enjoys in the waking state also, we may surmise that this seeming sleep was in fact a spiritual experience on an elevated plane of being. Thus continued his life a double life on parallel lines, a life in the world which he led mechanically and without interest, as one that did not really belong to the world, and a life in the spirit, of which the people around him had not even the faintest suspicion. This lasted till the end of the sixteenth year of his life. He was then in the highest class in the high school course, and it was expected that at the end of the course, He would sit for the matriculation examination of the University of Madras. But this was not to be. For then something happened, which brought the boy's schooling to an abrupt end. The age period of 16 and 17 is a critical one for all. In the average man, the mind is then overrun by imaginations and desires, which revolve round the sense of sex. But for a few exceptional souls, It is the time of the awakening to the true life, compared to which this thing that we call life is death, the life that begins with the blossoming of the spiritual perfections which are already latent in them. This we find to be the case in the lives of all the saints and sages of this world. It is also a fact appearing in the lives of the sages of the past that this awakening begins as a rule with a sudden fear of death. It is true that the fear of death is not unfamiliar to common men, for it comes often enough to them, but there is a difference in the reaction to this fear. To the common man it makes very little difference. He is led to think of death when he sees a funeral procession. Sometimes he begins to philosophize more or less on traditional lines, but this mood lasts only until his next meal. Afterwards he becomes normal again. 
the current of his life runs on the same lines as before. The born sage reacts differently to the thought of death. He begins to reflect coolly, but with all the force of his intelligence, on the problem of death. And this reflection is the starting point of a concentrated effort to transcend the realm of death. Thus it was in the case of Gautama Buddha. Thus it was also in the case of Ramana. Thus he reflected, who or what is it that dies? It is this visible body that dies. The kinsmen come and take it away and burn it to ashes. But when this body dies, shall I also die? That depends on what I really am. If I be this body, then when it dies, I also would die. But if I be not this, then I would survive. Then there arose in his mind an overpowering desire to find out then and there whether he, the real self of him, would survive after death. And it occurred to him that the surest way to find out would be to enact the process of death. This he did by imagining that the body was dead. A dead body does not speak nor breathe, nor has it any sensation. All this he imagined with such perfect realism that his body became inert and rigid just like a corpse. His vital energies were withdrawn from it and gathered into the mind which now turned inwards, animated by the will to find the real self, if any. At this moment a mysterious power rose up from the innermost core of his being and took complete possession of the whole mind and life. By that power he, that is to say, his mind and life, was taken inwards. What then happened is a mystery but we can gather some idea of it from the teachings of the sage himself. We must take it that possessed by this power, which is identical with what devotees call grace, the mind plunged deep into the source of all life, and mind was merged in it. All this happened while he was wide awake, and therefore he became aware of his own real self, free from all thought movement, this self was free from the bondage of desires and fears and therefore full of peace and happiness. The state which he now reached was just the egoless state described in a later chapter, the state in which the real self reigns alone and in serene calmness. Thus Ramana became a sage. We shall never know what that state is like until we ourselves shall reach it and abide in it. But with the help of his revelation, we shall be able to understand what it is not. From this we see that a sustained and one-pointed resolve to find the real self, which is the highest and purest form of devotion, is the means of winning that self. This is in accord with the text of the ancient revelation, which says, He alone shall find this self who is powerfully attracted to him in complete devotion, to him that self reveals himself as he really is. This is the highest truth of all religions. It was differently expressed by Jesus, who said, Ask, and it shall be given. Knock, and it shall be opened. It is this very path that the sage teaches in his answers to disciples and in his writings. In one of the latter, he calls it the direct path for all, by which all the problems of life are transcended. The state that is won by pursuing this path is called the natural state, Sahajabhava. It is so called because therein the self is manifest as he really is, and not as he appears to the ignorant. It is also described as the egoless state and the mindless state. The truth of that state is revealed by the sage and by ancient revelation is the subject of a later chapter. Here it is enough to say that the natural state is the highest there is, that for one that has attained that state, there is nothing else to be striven for. For him the pilgrimage of life is at an end.
Ramana had by this experience become a sage, or rather the sage that was always in him, became unveiled. For him, therefore, there could be no further evolution in spirituality. Mind and body are by this experience completely dissociated from the self. That is to say, the mind no longer identifies the body with the self. Ignorance being just this identification and nothing more, and the mind itself, as will be seen later, being an outcome of this ignorance. This great event is also called the destruction or dissolution of the mind. Hence, it is strictly true that for the sage there is no mind, nor body, nor world, but that does not mean that body and mind are destroyed in the sense that other people will cease to see them. For them, the sage's body and mind will continue to appear, and they would appear to be affected by events, and hence there can be a further history of the sage. The sage himself may seemingly be active in diverse ways, though these actions are not really his. Hence the course of events that occurred after this great event some of which are narrated here, do not really belong to the sage. They do not affect him in any way. Because Ramana had never read about nor heard of the nameless, formless, indescribable known to the learned as Brahman, he had no doubts as to the nature of the state which he won by this event. Later, when he came to know that the sacred books describe the state of deliverance as that in which the self is experienced as identical with that reality, he had not the least difficulty in understanding that he himself had attained that state. Whatever occurred in the life of the sage after this great event concerns only the body and the mind that apparently survived the event, and not the sage himself. The divine qualities and powers which are inherent to the natural state became soon manifest since their exercise was necessary for the fulfillment of the sage's mission in the world. Thus it happened that immediately after this great event, in the intervals when his mind was not wholly absorbed in the natural state, it began to feel a need of some object to take hold of. The only object that was acceptable was God, in whose love the sixty-three saints had found their highest happiness. So Ramana began to frequent the temple oftener than before. And there, in the presence of God, he would stand, while floods of tears streamed from his eyes, such tears as can flow only from the eyes of the most ardent of devotees. It is ever the earnest prayer of all devotees that they have such profound devotion as this, for they consider that a copious flow of tears is a manifestation of the highest devotion which itself is the fruit of divine grace. We can understand this manifestation in Ramana only if we suppose that in a previous life he had been such a great devotee. Also, these floods of tears might have, in this case, fulfilled some divine purpose. For the tears of divine love are purifying, and those that shed them are exalted thereby. The vehicles of consciousness are thereby transformed. So we may presume that in this way the body and the mind of Ramana underwent changes which made them worthy to serve as the abode of a great teacher, a messenger of God. Along with these manifestations there was also at the time an acute sensation of heat in the body. All these manifestations continued until the sage arrived at Tiruvannamali and found himself in the presence of the temple there. We are told of a similar sensation of heat in the case of Sri Ramakrishna. We saw that as a student, Ramana was annoyingly backward. Now he became worse than ever, for he was frequently lapsing into that mysterious state which he had won by his effortless quest of the real self. When he was out of it, he had not the least inclination for studies. His elders could not understand what it was that had occurred to the boy. They had always been inclined to be angry with him for his aversion to study, and now they were provoked more than ever. His elder brother, who was himself a student then, 
was greatly irritated by these new ways of his. One day, about six weeks after his first experience of the eagle estate, the brother saw him going into it when he ought to have been learning his lessons. This provoked a stinging remark from the elder one. What is the use of these things, books and other things that belong to a student, to one that is thus? The words went home, but the effect they produced was not what the speaker intended. At the time, the boy just smiled and resumed his book. But inwardly, he began to think. Yes, he is right. What is the use of books in school for me now? Immediately the idea took shape in his mind that he must leave his home and go and live far away, unknown to those that claimed him as their own. He had learned before this that his beloved Arunachala is the same as Tiruvannamale, a well-known place of pilgrimage. He had learned this from a relative. The latter on returning from a pilgrimage had told him in answer to his question that he had been to Arunachala. This was a great surprise for the lad, who never imagined that Arunachala was a place on this earth. The relative then explained to him that Arunachala is only another name for Tiruvannamale. Arunachala is the Sanskrit name of the hill, which is itself regarded as God's image. The Tamil form of it is Anamale Anamale. The place was far enough away from Madura for his present purpose, but not too far for him to reach. So he decided to leave home secretly and go there, and thereafter do as he may be guided by providence. Fortune favored his enterprise. His elder brother's school fee for the month had not yet been paid, and the latter gave him five rupees, which he was told to pay to the school. Out of this he took just three rupees thinking that this would suffice for his journey by rail. The remainder he left with a letter expressing his decision to go away in quest of his divine father, and insisting that no search should be made for him. He purchased a ticket and got into the train at Madura, but as soon as he had taken a seat, he fell into the eagle estate and was in it nearly all the time. He had hardly any appetite during the journey and ate next to nothing. He had made a mistake in planning his journey, but this was providentially set right. He had to walk part of the way because he had not money enough left. But on the way he obtained some money by pledging his golden ear ornaments and reached Tiruvannamale by rail. At once he went to the presence in the temple and cried in ecstasy. Father, I have come just according to thy command. And at once the burning heat in the body disappeared and therewith the sense of something being lacking. Also, there was not any more flow of tears after this except once, when much later he was composing a devotional hymn for the use of his disciples, which is one of his five hymns to Arunachala. Going out of the temple, he made a complete change in his externals. But this he did in a mechanical way, without thinking and making decisions. A barber's services were offered, and presently the lad had a complete shave on his head. He reduced his dress to the calpina or codpiece, and he threw on the steps of a tank the remainder of the cash, clothes, and whatever else he had brought with him from his last place of halt on the journey. All this was done with the conviction that the body was not himself and did not deserve to be treated as of any importance. He even omitted the bath that invariably follows a shave. But a sudden shower of rain drenched him on his way back to the temple. For long after this he had no fixed place of abode. He just sat in any place in which he could remain in the eagle estate, without disturbance from curious or mischievous people. For long periods he was totally unconscious of the body and its environment. The people who observed his ways took it that he was a recluse who had taken a vow of silence. And so they did not try to make him speak, and he did nothing to undeceive them. He remained silent. And this accidental silence continued for many years, so that in course of time he lost 
the ability to speak. Later, when disciples came to him and he had to answer their questions, he had to write his answers. But after a time, he recovered speech, not without some effort. He never lacked food, for the people recognized his exalted spirituality and were eager to supply his needs so that they might gain the merit of serving a holy one. But he had in the beginning some trouble with mischievous boys, which however did not disturb his inner peace. Soon after coming to Tiruvannamalai, as a result of his continuous experience of the eagle estate, he realized the truth of the highest of the ancient revelation, I and my father are one. Thus he became a perfect sage. Now he no longer needed to enter into himself in order to enjoy the happiness of the real self. He had it all the time, whether he was aware of the world or not. He thus became able to fulfill his mission in the world as a messenger of God, or rather of the real self, there being no God but that self. It is this state of uninterrupted experience of the real self, which is known as the natural state, Sahaja Bhava, the vigorous search for the missing boy that was made by his family proved a failure. But some years after his flight, they came to know by mere accident that he was at Tiruvannamale. First his uncle, and then his mother, came to him and importuned him to come back and live near them if he would not live with them. But they could make no impression on him. It was as if he did not recognize their claims on him. Such claims were founded on the assumption that his body was himself. Much later, his mother and young brother, at that time the sole surviving brother, came to live with him, and he let them do so. He took advantage of this opportunity to instruct and guide his mother on the path to spiritual perfection. On various occasions during the early part of his life at Tiruvannamalai, the sage passed through many kinds of trials but nothing could ruffle his peace of mind. He exemplifies in himself the truth expressed in the Gita and other sacred books, that the man who is firmly established in the eagle estate will not be moved from it by the severest trials. The correct explanation seems to be that the events of the external world, including even what happens to the body, are not real to the sage, for he dwells in the state of unassailable Happiness, a happiness which is so abundant that it radiates around him, draws to him disciples and devotees, and attaches them to him for life. Indeed, many of them look upon him as God in human form. It is a curious fact about this sage that he had never had any book knowledge concerning the real self. The ancient lore which reveals as much of the truth of that self as can be expressed in words never came his way, nor was he initiated by anyone into the secrets of that lore, nor did he even know that there was any such lore, till long after he had won the state which is their subject matter. But when disciples came to him and some of them wanted light on the inner sense of certain obscure passages in the sacred lore, he had to read those books, and he understood their hidden meanings with perfect ease because those books described just that very state, the eagle state, which he was constantly enjoying as his own. Thus, he was able to give out the correct sense of those passages, a sense that is beyond the grasp of the most diligent students of that lore. Thus it happens that this sage is an exception to the general rule of the ancient lore, that every aspirant to the state of deliverance must become a disciple of a competent teacher and be initiated by him into the mysteries. The competent teacher is termed a guru. Another instructive feature of the sage is that he teaches more by silence than by word of mouth. Visitors come to him from far and near with bundles of questions, but when they take their seats in his presence, after making due obeisance, they forget to put their questions and after a time they find that the questions have evaporated. The would-be questioner either realizes that the questions need no answer, or finds the answers in himself. 
The sage, however, quite readily answers any question that is not purely worldly, and when he does answer, his words are clear but brief. And as a rule, his teachings are free from the technical terms that abound in most of the books. And as he speaks, so he writes. That may be taken as a proof that he speaks from his own experience, not from the knowledge of books. The learned man cannot talk without using the phraseology of the books he has studied. It may be said that the books master the man, and not the man the books. The sage has written a few books which are all very brief but full of meaning. But these he wrote not because he himself wanted to write books, but because he was importuned by certain disciples who were eager to have a revelation from the sage himself, not being content with the extant sacred lore. He has also, at the request of disciples, translated some of the older sacred lore into Tamil. The disciples of the sage are in a stronger position than those who have to rely on the sacred lore of the past. Answers that the sage has given orally to questions put to him have also been recorded by disciples. Disciples come to the sage from all over the world, and they profit by his silent influence as well as his teachings, according to the intensity of their desire for deliverance from bondage. Their impressions about him vary according to their mentality. But all recognize that he is a unique person, worthy of profound veneration. What is the secret of this power in him? The answer is that he has attained that state of deliverance which everyone aspires to more or less earnestly. Some also find in his presence a foretaste of that state of being. One particular trait that marks him out as unique is the fact that neither praise nor censure has any effect on him. He is neither pleased to hear praise of himself nor pained by words of censure or detraction. This may not seem to be very important, but the fact is that other perfections of character are to be seen in varying degree in almost any good man, but not so this particular trait. Indeed, this is the one trait by which the sage can be recognized. It is pointed out that even the most saintly of men, if they have not won the egoless state, react just like common men to praise and blame. So long as even a trace of ego remains, it is impossible not to be affected by praise or blame. Only the sage in the egoless state is unaffected by them. Being egoless, the sage sees no distinction between himself and others, nor between one person and another. For him neither sex, nor fortune, nor social status has any existence. His sense of equality is absolute. Even animals, dogs, cats, birds, squirrels, he treats as if they were human. And, incredible as it seems, in his eyes no one is ignorant or a sinner. Many maintain that a sage alone can recognize a sage, and that therefore no one can positively assert that this one is a sage. This is not altogether true. He that is in earnest to find a competent guide, a guru, on the path of deliverance has to decide somehow whether the person he would elect be a sage or not. And if he be of pure and devout mind, he will be aided by divine grace to make the right choice. It is also a help for him to understand the profound truths taught in the sage's revelation. We have already noticed a few of the marks of a real sage. A few more will be set down later. The mission of the born sage or messenger of God is twofold. He renews and confirms the essentials of the old revelation. He also serves as a center of divine grace to his disciples, especially to those who, intuitively or through understanding of the sacred teaching, recognize him as an embodiment of God, and therefore bear unto him the same devotion that they formerly bore to God, seeing no distinction between the two. This is in accordance with the spirit of the ancient sacred lore, which is expressed in the following verse. Obeisance to the Lord of Divine Wisdom, 
infinite like the sky, who is three in one, as God, the Guru, and the real self. It seems that for one who understands this truth and becomes a disciple and devotee of the sage, it may not be quite necessary to go to the sage and live near him always. The sage transcends time and space and is therefore everywhere. We shall now make a study of the teachings of all the sages, always giving special prominence to those of this sage. Chapter 2 Are We Happy? This world is to us a means to an end, namely happiness. At least it is so for most of us. Some there are who maintain that we are here for the sake of the world, not for our own sake. What they mean is that we ought not to live for ourselves, but for the world. But that is quite another matter. The fact is that we live for ourselves in the first place, and for the world also, in so far as the good of the world happens to be also our own. That being the case, we shall have to consider some time or other whether we have found happiness, and if not, then why? We shall have to think of the question whether in seeking happiness in and through this world we have not made some false assumptions. We begin life with the belief that happiness can be had in and through this world, and most people go on believing thus to the very end. They never pause and think. They do not take notice of the fact that their hopes of happiness have not been realized. How then can they consider the further question why those hopes have been falsified? Not all religions and philosophies of the world can do for us what we can do for ourselves, if we pause and think. For what we get from these is just so much mind lumber, mere fashions of thought and speech which do not fit in with what we really are. For only what we find out for ourselves from our own experience can be of real use to us. Further, we can find nothing of real value even from our own experience if we do not pause and think. If these religions and philosophies just hasten the day when we shall pause and think, they shall have done quite enough for us. What keeps us from pausing and thinking is the belief that we are getting or shall soon get from life the thing we want. Happiness. The one thing that can possibly shake this belief is experience of the tragic sign of life. We are told by the sage of Arunachala that this is nature's way, and he gives us the analogy of dreams to prove it. When we are dreaming of pleasant things, we do not awake but we do so as soon as we see visions of a frightful nature. A life of placid enjoyment is naturally inimical to serious thinking on serious subjects, and here the religious-minded are no better than the rest of us. Let us suppose that we have found life disappointing, if not quite intolerable, that we have found it so either on our own account or as representatives of the whole race of men. We must suppose so since these inquiries are only for those that have so found it. In fact, many of us have found it so, and that not once, but again and again. What have we done each time? We have consulted priests or astrologers or prayed to God. These are the popular patent remedies for the disease that afflicts us all, and these have only postponed the crisis. And this will be so till we pause and think. We sought happiness through all the weary years. Again and again we were on the point of winning it and making it ours forever. But each time we were deceived. But without pausing to think, as we shall now do, we simply went on in the same old way. If now we pause and think, the thought will occur to us that probably we set out on the quest of happiness without a right understanding of the true nature and source of it. First, let us look at happiness itself and find out what it is. What we mean by happiness is something constant, something that will abide with us in all its freshness and purity 
so long as we ourselves exist. What the world has given us is not that, but something transient and variable, and its rightful name is pleasure. Happiness and pleasure are two entirely different things. But we assume that pleasures are the very texture of happiness. We assume that if we can provide for a constant stream of pleasures for all the time, we shall secure happiness. But it is the very nature of pleasure to be inconstant, for pleasure is just a reaction to the impact of outside things. Certain things give us pleasure, and we seek to acquire and keep hold of them. But the same objects do not give equal pleasure at all times. Sometimes they even give pain. Thus we are often cheated of the pleasure we bargain for and find that we are in for pain at times. Pleasure and pain are in fact inseparable companions. The sage of Arunachala tells us that even pleasure is not from things. If the pleasure that we taste in life were really from things, that it must be more when one has more things, less when one has less, and none when one has none. But that is not the case. The rich who have an abundance of things are not exactly happy, nor are the poor who have very little exactly unhappy. And all alike, if and when they get sound, dreamless sleep, are supremely happy. To make sure of the undisturbed enjoyment of sleep, we provide ourselves with every available artificial aid, soft beds and pillows, mosquito curtains, warm blankets or cool breezes, and so on. The loss of sleep is accounted a grievous evil. For its sake, men are willing to poison the very source of life, the brain, with deadly drugs. All this shows how much we love sleep, and we love it because in it, we are happy. We are thus justified in suspecting that true happiness is, as many wise men have told us, something belonging to our own inner nature. Sages have ever taught that pleasure has no independent existence. It does not reside in external objects at all. It appears to do so because of a mere coincidence. Pleasure is due to a release of our own natural happiness, imprisoned in the inner depths of our being. This release occurs just when, after a rather painful quest, a desired object is won, or when a hated one is removed. As a hungry street dog munching on a bare bone and tasting its own blood might think the taste is in the bone, so do we assume that the pleasures we enjoy are in the things that we seek and get hold of. It may be said that desire is the cause of our being exiled from the happiness that is within us, and its momentary cessation just allows us to taste a little of that happiness for the time being. Because we are most of the time desiring to get hold of something or to get rid of something, we are most of the time unhappy. The desire to get rid of something is due to fear. So desire and fear are the two enemies of happiness. And so long as we are content to remain subject to them, we shall never be really happy. To be subject to desire or fear is itself unhappiness. And the more intense the desire or the fear, the keener is the unhappiness. Desire tells us each time, Now get thou this, and then you shall be happy. We believe it, implicitly, and set about getting it. We are unhappy for wanting it, but we forget the unhappiness in the effort. If we do not get it, we have to suffer. Neither are we happy if we get it, for desire then finds something else for us to strive for, and we fail to see how desire is fooling us all the time. The fact is desire is like a bottomless pit which one can never fill up, or like the all-consuming fire which burns the fiercer the more we feed it. As desire is without end, so is fear. For the things that fear tells us to avoid are without end. Thus we come to this conclusion. So long as desire and fear 
have sway over us, we shall never reach happiness. If we be content to remain in bondage to them, we must, as rational beings, renounce all hope of happiness. But knowing that desire and fear are enemies, can we not put them away by sheer willpower? The answer that experience gives us is no. We may, like the Stoics, wrestle with them and succeed in overcoming them for a time. But the victory does not last, and finally we give up the fight. Without help from someone else, we feel we cannot hope to achieve lasting deliverance. And who can help us? but one that has himself conquered desire and fear, and won for himself perfect happiness. Such a one we must seek and find if we are sincerely and earnestly resolved to become free from these our foes, the foes of happiness. He alone can show us the path and also give the power to tread the path, for he knows both the goal and the path. The ancient lore tells us, and we can now see that it does so rightly, that one that is in earnest for freedom must seek and reverently question one that is himself free. He that feels acutely the need for a remedy for the ills that are inseparable from life cannot help seeking someone who is competent to guide him aright. He can no more help it than a sick man can help going in search of a healer. There have been men in the past who had won true happiness for themselves and were thus able to help others also. What they taught their own disciples is recorded, more or less faithfully, in the scriptures of the religions that are supposed to have founded. But the records as we now find them are incomplete and more or less distorted by the want of clarity of those that wrote them down. The teachings were given orally. They were not written down till long after the teachers had passed away. They cannot have for us the same value as the words heard from a living teacher. And this not only because we can be sure that the teaching is genuine, but also, or chiefly, because the living teacher is a center of spiritual power, which we lack. Such a teacher is the sage of Arunachala.